Hey, Sanctuary family, um, thank you all so much again for being a part of our worship service today. Uh, we are excited as a part of our American Idol series to continue a conversation around a number of American ideals, these, um, these things that are very, very core to what we know of the, the American dream, the American way. And we want to hold up these ideals and compare them to the way of Jesus, just asking what is it as Jesus followers that we're invited to um, to think about and the ways that we're call, called to live even and how does that intersect with some of these american ideals and so we're calling the series american idols which is uh, the brilliance of pastor rose and so i'm excited to have pastor rose with us today i'm excited to also have our friend um reverend dominique gilliard who i will um invite to to tell us a little bit about who he is in just a moment um but this second the second message in um this series is called American Idols, is really around this idea of law and order, this idea of safety and security. Um, and I, I wanted us to, as we were thinking about this series, I wanted us to really think about this idea of law and order because it's something that um, I believe in some ways has been weaponized um, in this political season. Um, it's almost a code for something else. And I want us to dig into that conversation today and think about what, what actually are we talking about when we talk about law and order? And when we call for safety in the ways that um, we've heard in this season, what does that mean for the body of Christ? What does that mean for our neighbors in communities, particularly communities like North Minneapolis? And so I'm excited to have a brother, a friend, an expert, I would say, in the area of um, both faith and justice, Reverend Dominique Gilliard, uh, to join us today for this conversation. Um, Dominique is the Director of Racial Righteousness and Reconciliation for our denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Church. Um, so he's there in Chicago. We love. Um, Dominique is also um, an award-winning author of a book, Rethinking Incarceration, that I know many of you have read already, but if you have not read the book, I would encourage you, please uh, get that book and read it, make it, there you go, there you go. That's beautiful cover. It's even more beautiful when you open that cover up and see what this brother has written. Um, Dominique is also an adjunct professor at North Park uh, Seminary there in Chicago. He serves on the board of directors for CCDA, the Christian uh, Community Development Association, and, and he is a leader in every every aspect of, of the word, every every way you could use that word, Dominique is a leader. And so I'm excited about having him with us today. Dominique, can you uh, say hello to Sanctuary and then tell us a little more about yourself? Yeah, hey, Sanctuary family. Uh, excited to be with you. I've had the privilege of worshiping with you a number of times and uh, really excited to be able to kind of be a part of bringing the word uh, in this format. Uh, so I'm originally uh, from the metro Atlanta area, uh, grew up in the shadows of Dr. King uh, and had a father who worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference for a decade. And so Dr. King's legacy was profoundly informative for my understanding of faith, particularly when it came to uh, navigating what all too often exists as a bifurcation within the church between uh, evangelism and justice uh kind of and always helping me to understand that biblically those things are inherently interconnected in a way that you cannot disconnect them and still authentically proclaim to bear witness to the gospel uh and so um really pressing into what it means to uh pursue the greatest great commandment and the great commission uh, in unison um, and not seeing them as disconnected. Uh, that, that work has really led me to, uh, to this work of conversations around criminal justice. And one of the things that I get to do uh, as adjunct professor at North Park Theological Seminary is that I get a chance to teach inside of our restorative arts program in Stateville Correctional Facility, uh, which is a maximum security prison. Uh, and I get a chance to teach courses where we are really training up ministers uh, to uh, be ministers behind bars. And the focus of the program is how do you uh, disciple everyday peacemakers who do conflict de-escalation in conflict-ridden spaces. So we'll process that a little bit more, but that's uh, one of the reasons why this conversation is so near and dear to my heart because of uh, the communion I have with our brothers behind bars. Awesome, awesome. 
Awesome. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, so, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, this, this, even that the phrase law and order is a loaded phrase. Um, and, and one of the things I've seen in this particular election is a little bit of back and forth between the two presidential candidates of who's more the law and order person. And th there's this, um, unspoken, I think, assumption, or, or at least this idea that gets put out there that um, the police are often um, the last line of defense between the people, or at least some of the people, and anarchy. Um, that if we don't have this, this incredibly broad military style police uh, force in place, that um, the bad people, whoever they are in a particular context, are going to come and get us and just carry us away. And so when you hear that phrase, law and order, what, what comes to mind for you um, and how do you process that? Yeah, so I want to historically situate that phrase for us a little bit before I answer. Um, one of the things that we really have to reckon with in our nation is the fact that we live in a nation where law enforcement's job is to enforce the law. Uh, they don't, they're not supposed to have the responsibility of morally discerning if a law is just or unjust. Uh, they, they, don't, they aren't the ones who actually uh, create the laws. Their job is just to enforce the laws. Mm -hmm. And so when we take that seriously and look at the reality that in our nation we have e elongated history of unjust laws, then we have to see how that puts law enforcement in a situation in which they are enforcing things that are antithetical to the will of God, particularly to bring this into uh, the church. And that's not to say that that's the truth universally. I'm just saying that there are elements of that that we have to really reckon with. So when we look at like the institution of slavery, which we all can say now was antithetical to the will of God, mm -hmm. uh, one of law enforcement's first job was to return runaway slaves. Um, when we look after slavery and particularly after the Reconstruction era, when we started to see the resuscitation of white supremacy, particularly in the South. Um, and when I say white supremacy, I want to say where white uh, leaders are put in positions of power and get a chance to create the laws and enforce the laws in a way that disproportionately uh, impacted Black people in the South, that's particularly for this context what I'm talking about, um, then we see why there were intellectuals like W.E.B. Du Bois, who in 1903, in his famous book, The Souls of Black Folk, starts to write things like, Black folks say that only colored boys are sent to jail, and not because they are guilty, but because the state needs criminals to eke out its in income by their forced labor. Mm -hmm. Or you get civil rights activists like Fannie Lou Hamer, who says black people know what white people mean when they say law and order. Mm -hmm. um, we start to see that uh, law and order starts to function in some of the ways that you are pointing to, uh, where it really exists as a dog whistle um, and where there are racially encoded meanings in that phraseology where people never have to use the logic of race, but is very much enacted through what they're articulating. Yeah. Um, and so we saw this particularly with the launch of the war on drugs in 1971 uh, and the particularly around the crack epidemic. And I think for people to understand and compare and contrast, if we were to look at the way in which uh, the crack epidemic was uh, we looked at individuals as deviant, um, as people who were morally flawed, as people who actually came from, you know, communities that didn't have fathers and all this pathology that was associated with the use of crack. And we compare it to the way that we are depicting individuals who are falling victim to the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, we can start to see some of the ways in which law and order and dog whistle politics really function because it's a categorically different depiction of the person who is caught up in substance abuse. Um, in the 70s, we said that the problem was the individual and the communities that they came from and the broken families in which gave rise to this dysfunctional behavior. And then presently today, we're talking about the opioid epidemic as a, a public health 
crisis um, as it, as something that is kind of transpiring in spite of individual morality, a good family structure, healthy, wealthy communities in which people are, might be coming from, is really a public health crisis. And so that's part of the ways in which we can really an analyze the divergence. But I think we need to be very clear uh, because sometimes people think that um, mass incarceration or law and order is a conservative Republican agenda. Mass incarceration and the rhetoric of law and order is a bipartisan agenda. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats use that rhetoric and they use that rhetoric uh, to advance individual political careers and um, partisan political agendas. Um, and both use um, really outlier grotesque manifestations of violent crimes and depict them as if they are more normative than they actually are to incentivize us to cling to very punitive responses to crime when the reality is that the vast majority of people locked up in our criminal justice system are there for nonviolent offenses and um when we look at drugs even um we have to say that the vast majority of people who are there for drug offenses, uh, it's been proven that the most helpful response would actually be to get them medical interventions mm -hmm. than to incarcerate them. Because oftentimes when people are incarcerated with substance abuse addictions, they don't get the medical interventions they need behind bars. So their addiction actually is that is exacerbated and they don't actually get the treatment that will actually help them tend to the root causes of the problem and actually get the restoration that we're hoping they get behind bars. Yeah, yeah. That's that's super helpful. Um, I, I love that you gave the historical context. As a historian myself, I think context matters. Like we, we, there are no isolated situations. Everything comes from something and then contributes to something else. And so that that's super helpful. I also love that you said it's not it's not like this is not one party or the other. One one has gotten this right and the other has has not um, gotten it right we've seen consistently that both parties have failed to, to address this in ways that we find um, loving or, or even just to use that word. Um, and so I, I think as, as we talk to our congregation where you'll find people who are um, coming from both sides of the political spectrum, you'll see that we have work to do regardless of how you identify politically. And I, I want to tend to one thing that you raised in your question that I didn't fully answer. You talked yeah. about how law and order is really depicted as this last line of defense between us and them. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to really tend to the ways in which uh, language is deployed that makes us subscribe to logics of us and them. Mm -hmm. um, when we start to think about us and them, and again, that both sides of the aisle do it, uh, I'll use an example from the Democrats, when uh, we call people super predators, and mm -hmm. we talk about them uh, being people that we have to keep away from our children and our communities so they can be safe and flourishing, uh, we start to think that when we expel people, we also expel problems. Mm -hmm. um, but that lets us off the hook from actually having to do the real analysis of systems and structures and communities to see what gives rise to that kind of dysfunctional behavior. And yeah. so um, they did a study here in Chicago that's really important. Um, they did a five-year study to see how many single city blocks within the city had over a million dollars of investment in incarcerating residents from that single city block. Chicago has 851 what we call million dollar blocks where there's over a million dollars of invested in incarcerating residents from one single city block. Every single one of those million dollar blocks is on the south and the west side of the city where black and brown people live. Uh, not one of those million dollar blocks is in the city core in the loop or on the north side, uh, but they're all in the south and the west side of the cities and million dollar blocks were hallmarked as uh, had three hallmarks. They were communities that had high rates of home foreclosures high rates of school closures and low levels of uh, employment. And so what we're really talking about is the least of these, those who have the least access to vocationally better themselves, to edu educationally better themselves and to have stable housing. And so what we're seeing is that disproportionately the least of these are the ones who are getting swept up into the criminal justice system. And they are the ones who uh, we, 
get a chance from the outside if we're not coming from that context to pathologize the behavior as opposed to scrutinizing the systems and the infrastructure that's giving rise to that dysfunction. So when we think about law and order as that way, we do start to subscribe to this logic that we do have to keep ourselves safe from those people. And the way to do that is to cling tightly to this punitive response to crime, as opposed to looking at it more restoratively. So the last thing that analysis did is that it flipped the question and it said, instead of continuing to invest a million dollars in incarcerating people from this community, what would happen if we took just 10% of that money and reinvested in it to allow members from that community to start to systemically have opportunities to flourish and to reach their full potential? That would release $480,000 to reimagine what it looks like to do community investment as opposed to just sustain the status quo. And so I think, you know, those are the types of questions that we really have to ask if we want to get down to the root cause of social dysfunction and the division that emit, uh, arises out of the kind of economic disparity that exists from community to community. Sure. Wow, that's incredible. I appreciate you giving that um, that particularity of that data, because that it illustrates just how wide and deep and entrenched this really is. Um, so I appreciate that, Dominique. Thank you. So we've talked in your book, Dominique, you talk a lot about kind of reframing our view of what of what justice looks like, but also more so how it's become ingrained in our theology. We have very much a retributive um, theological lens that is actually counter to what the Bible says. And because this series is about giving this alternative, I wonder if you could just answer the question, is justice all the same? What is the difference between God's justice and the criminal justice um, that we're talking about in the United States? But more so, in your work with restorative justice, what is, could you define retributive justice versus restorative justice, which is that alternative that Jesus um, is asking us um, to be mindful of, to follow after as his disciples? Yeah, um, so restorative justice, uh, I believe, the major difference is just even in the title. Uh, it says that for justice to be manifested, restoration has to be part of the outcome. Um, within our criminal justice system, the biggest problem is that there is not a tangible pathway for restoration for people who are in housed within, encased within the system. Um, and so I think this becomes more and more clear for people who live into Matthew 25's commission to go and visit those who are behind bars. Uh, when you actually go, uh, and that, I think the going is the imperative piece. I think people who have the hardest time imagining what's wrong or understanding what's wrong with our system haven't actually gone and actually lived into Matthew 25 or Hebrews 13, 3 that tells us we're supposed to remember the incarcerated as if we were incarcerated with them, suffering alongside of them. When you actually go, you get to see kind of the dehumanizing realities that are present um, within our system and all of the gaps um, that need to be tended to, uh, to create a, an environment where rehabilitation and restoration and reconciliation are actual possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when we talk about uh, the difference uh, within our criminal justice system right now, the way that it functions is that uh, a violation is not considered a violation against the individual or even against the community. It's considered a violation against the state. So, Rose, if something happened to you, um, and after in the aftermath, when it comes to trying to determine what accountability looks like or even sentencing, 
you actually don't get a chance to speak into the process. Mm -hmm. um, so within a system where an offense occurs, the person who's been impacted by the offense doesn't even get a chance to speak into the process. That seems to be something categorically wrong with that. But also to understand that when an offense happens against you, it doesn't just impact you, it impacts your family, impacts your community. And so restorative justice says that instead of an offense being an offense against the state, an offense is an offense against a community. And since the offense is an offense against the community, uh, when it comes to discerning what accountability looks like, um, then there needs to be community stakeholders who are a part of the discernment process, but also a part of the accountability process. But it doesn't just look at it on, from your perspective. It also takes into consideration the interest of the offending party. And one of the things that we also see within our present system is that uh, there are a lot of of uh, loopholes or a lot of kind of stumbling blocks for people who are trying to be an accountability uh, pres accountability presence for those who have caused offense. Mm -hmm. Well, restorative justice says that not only do you need uh, support when you're trying to reckon with accountability and what's transpired, but so does the offending party. And so the offending party needs somebody who's in their life who can speak prophetic truth into their life and help them reckon with the implications of the offense that's transpired and can actually encourage them through the process of actually, actually seeking amends. Uh, the other thing, restorative justice has been more proven to produce reconciliation because a lot of times when an offense transpires, the person who caused the offense doesn't even understand the full magnitude of what they've done. A lot of times you have traumatized people who are acting out of their trauma, who are just trying to either make ends meet or do what's logical uh, to them, given the limited situations they find themselves in or the limitations of their perspective of what's possible given the context in which they're coming from. And they need somebody to actually sit them down and help them to understand how their offense has categorically re-altered or sometimes decimated uh, an entire person or community's uh, life rhythms. They need to understand the significance. And through that understanding, and when the person who has been offended, if they are ready, they get a chance to come and actually have a face-to-face uh, meeting with the person and they get to actually express their heart to the other person and that ability to meet has been more proven to produce reconciliation than anything the state has to offer and so there's just philosophically a different approach that says that um one for justice to be made manifest there has to be a plan for restoration uh two uh when we can when we really reckon with the offense, who is at the table doing that reckoning is c categorically different based off our present system and a restorative justice approach. And then third, it says that everybody in the midst of pursuing reconciliation needs support and some form of accountability and processing to actually unpack what's happened and to envision what moving forward together in pursuit of life together looks like and entails. And so um, that those are the categorically different things. Some critics will try to say that restorative justice is soft on crime, that it doesn't really hold people accountable. That's categorically not true. And we have empirical evidence to point to that. And I'll come back to some of that a little bit later. Oh, that's helpful. That's really helpful. I think it paints that picture of, of really that restoration, that shalom that we do seek as Christians, as Christ followers. So thank you for that. I want to actually read some of your own words from your book, Rethinking Incarceration, and just ask for some of your reflection, especially being mindful of the, the context, the season that we're in right now. So in Rethinking Incarceration, you say that when we surrender, to the, re the responsibility of facilitating communal conflict to the state, like you shared, as you just shared in your um, comment, um, history illustrates that Christians, we become disengaged citizens, seduced into believing communities can rid themselves of social ills by simply identifying, weeding out, and quarantining deviant individuals. Now, this is that's powerful because we've talked about law and order. We've talked about the criminal justice system up till now, 
but now you are really linking what it means as Christians and how we've even maybe become um, believed maybe um, kind of the lure of what law and order tells us in our very individualistic society. So what are some of the things that you would encourage us um, to bear in mind as followers of Jesus about how law and order actually, as you just shared, you, you shared, you know, how it impacts people and families and communities, but um, how can we kind of live into this alternative more? Yeah, um, as the church, we're called the social, social stewardship um to the to toilsome work of cultivating communities where communal flourishing and shalom are not infringed upon by systemic injustice kind of and this this us and them kind of wrecked individualism that prohibits us from seeing ourselves as part of a broader collective um biblical justice is about making things right not simply recognizing or defining individual rights uh it's concerned with the right relationship of of human beings to God and to one another. Um, and kind of, it's really trying to reckon with the rightness of relationship on every level, um, which means the individual level, the communal level, but also the systemic level, uh, reckoning with some of the brokenness within our systems and structures. Um, but I think when we talk about kind of what is the role of the church is, we have to recognize that God's justice is inherently restorative. Um, and the point of accountability is to realign oneself with God's purpose for their lives, God's uh, will in the world, and for our ability to bear witness to the rest of the world that when brokenness transpires, there's actually a solution. There's actually a healing balm, and we actually have a blueprint for how we live that out within our context that then will point to people who don't know God and actually show that something else is possible. Uh, I really think about this kind of in light of Jesus's uh, commandment to us, uh, where it says in John uh, 13, it talks about uh, if we choose to love one another by this, the world will know that we are Jesus's disciples. And I think we read that passage, but we kind of skip over the if, like it's conditional. Like when, when violation happens, we have the opportunity to actually cling to law and order to like resort to this us and them type of thinking, or to just kind of like distance ourselves from the problem if we have the luxury of not living in a context in which these things are kind of manifesting themselves most intensely. But that's not what God is commissioning us into. Like Jesus is saying like, yes, the if is a choice, but because of who you are and whose you are, you're, con you're commissioned to participate in a different way. You're commissioned to love in a different way. And scripture tells us that we only know what love is because of Jesus first sacrificially laying his life down on our behalf. And so therefore our, our engagement in the world is supposed to be categorically different because we're marked by the cross. And that marking kind of calls us into a different ethic in the world. And that ethic doesn't align itself with law and order. That ethic commissions us to sacrificial love which really moves us into honestly perilous territory um uncertain territory like we're commissioned to enter into the chaos and i like i want to say that with great sensitivity yeah. understanding what's been going on in minneapolis but instead of being people who are on the sidelines who are just commentating, like the gospel commissions us into the, the muck and the mire, like we're commissioned into the, the unrest and we're commissioned to participate in a distinctive manner, again, because of who and whose we are. So I think um, this brings into conversations which uh, the foundation of law and order is really trying to answer, but it's trying to answer from an, an imperial perspective. Um, and I don't know how much y'all have deconstructed kind of empire and its theological implications, but basically, like empire says that the that, that safety comes through a fortified military, through, through, the, through force and might. The safety comes through uh, a very punitive response to crime. Um, 
But the gospel actually tells us that safety comes in a different manifestation. Um, but even it questions the whole notion of safety um, in, in regards to how do we think about it. Um, and so the gospel really doesn't tell us that safety is something that we're promised. Um, what the gospel tells us is that God will be present with us as we follow the, where the spirit leads. And honestly, the spirit doesn't always lead us into comfort zones. I mean, we think about right after Jesus is baptized, the spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness intentionally for Satan to test Jesus. And so like, that's not what we, that's not what we normally think about when we think about the spirit's leading and where the spirit will take us. But oftentimes uh, the Spirit does commission us into places and spaces that we would never go on our own. Um, and it leads us to sacrificial love that honestly we couldn't muster up in our own strength. And so I think when we think about this notion of safety or what does it mean to engage in the, the brokenness that abounds in many of our communities, um, the Spirit is going to lead us into what might feel like hostile territory. Um, but the scriptures assure us that God is present with us when we go into those places. Mm -hmm. And the more intentional we are about praying prayers like search me, oh God, reveal to me anything that is not of you that's within me, like we are positioning ourselves to live distinctively for Jesus when we go into those hostile spaces and places. And we are we are empowered by the resurrection power of the spirit to actually contend for something different than just our own individual interests. We actually are, com we're commissioned and compelled and empowered by the spirit to actually live into a uh, kind of Jeremiah perspective of flourishing and shalom, which it says when we seek the peace and the prosperity of the, our neighbor, that's when our peace and our prosperity and our flourishing is found. But, you know, even Jeremiah, that's rooted in the Philippians 2, uh, Christ hymn, where Christ tells us that we are supposed to, again, put the interest of others before our own. Um, and when we do that, then we actually take on the mindset of Christ and actually are able to really bear witness to the kingdom um, in the midst of the now and the not yet. And so um, I think some of those notions are all connected, but I think we have to really be careful about distinguishing between the ways of this world, a kind of imperial logic, a kind of Romans 12, kind of don't be conformed to the patterns and the logics of this world, even in regards to how we define safety, how we decide, define flourishing, how we define these different things um, in this context and how the gospel defines these things. Yeah. And so I'll kind of pause there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, let's... Dominique, you, you don't know um, how much good stuff you just gave us, like how rich um, that is. I, I think you're, you're speaking, and, and I'm going to give credit to the Holy Spirit working through you, that you're, you're speaking into the very real realities that we're experiencing right here in Minneapolis right now, um, particularly in, in, in our community of North Minneapolis, where we, we have seen an uptick in, in violence um, over these last several months. But I love that you are pointing us back to the reality of who we are in Jesus and saying um, we can we, we can be honest about what's happening all around us. And there is at the very same time a way that we're called to respond to those things, knowing that God is with us, but also knowing that we're not by ourselves, that we, we it, it's also I, I feel here a very high challenge that you're giving us as a congregation to say, we shouldn't have individual members feeling like they're going through this stuff on their own. Like there's some work for us to do to draw near to one another and lean into the ways of Jesus in this. And, and so I, I appreciate so much of what you're saying and you're, you're, you're speaking, you're, you're giving healing balm to situations that I, I we haven't even talked about really. So. Um, and the fear is real. Like I want to, I want to pause and just affirm like the fear is real. Like, we all desire to be safe, even though that's not a promise that the gospel gives us. It's, yeah. it's a natural human desire. We want to protect our kids. We want to protect our property. We want to protect the things that we care for. But in that protection or that desire to protect, 
we can't allow that desire to be more powerful than what the gospel is calling us to. Yeah. And, and I think we also have to reimagine what it means to desire those things. Of, oftentimes what it means to desire those things is actually to go to places and spaces that we would never think to go. So when I think about uh, communal flourishing or kind of promoting uh, safety on our streets, through going into the prisons and actually being a part of this program, I've actually found that one of the most intentional ways that I can invest in communal flourishing and actually provide opportunities for our neighborhoods to be transformed is to actually invest in people who are behind bars who are actually going to be released and go back into communal contexts, yeah. uh, which are not kind of rooted in the same gospel truths and yeah. we get a chance to actually say like hey there's a different way and i want to actually bear witness to that way but i want to do it to you in relationship in mutual uh submission to one another not in a hierarchical i'm coming here to teach you but i want to actually walk alongside of you as your brother or sister in christ and actually bear witness to the fact that something else is possible uh when we actually look at this from a criminal justice piece uh, i'll stop here but when we look at recidivism which is somebody actually reoffending and going back uh behind bars it's been proven that access to higher education is the most effective way to reduce recidivism. Um, wow. And the higher access to education you get behind buyers, the lower chance you'll ever go back be, uh, go back to jail or prison. Um, so for every dollar we invest in higher education behind bars, we get $5 return on our investment. There is nothing that's that fiscally responsible. And there's also been nothing that's been proven to uh, actually decrease recidivism rates. So, right, for example, uh, our program in North Park, we're the only institution in the state of Illinois that provides high, uh, graduate, level, graduate level education for people behind bars. Everybody else provides undergraduate, which is great, but when you actually provide graduate level education, the recidivism numbers drop even lower to the point that some programs uh, have produced uh, recidivism rates as low as 5%. Uh, for people who've been able to engage in graduate education. And so it's just a paradigm shift in even how we think about safety and what does it mean to really fight for the safety and the flourishing of our communities. Uh, so. Wow, wow, thank you, man. Thank you, you you poured out so much already and I think have cast a, a broad vision of what what this, um, this kingdom way of, of thinking about law and order and safety as opposed to what we seem to be presented these two bad options by by our society but if, if there were anything else you would add Dom, just this is your chance to just really say here's what what i believe god calls us to in this area can you just take a few minutes and, and just share anything that you haven't already shared you've already blessed us so much but if there's anything left in the tank <laughs> <laughs> what else would you have us to know yeah, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about the success of restorative justice, because I know it can just feel like abstract. And yeah. then I'll just kind of leave us, bless us with a, a few words at the end. Yeah. So over the past 40 years, restorative justice has an impressive global track record in criminal justice reform, educational systems, and addressing broader societal trauma. Restorative justice has created alternatives to traditional legal processes, the punitive legal system we've been talking about, um, restoring relationships and creating uh, communal healing. It has helped eliminate the need for juvenile justice facilities in New Zealand, and it has also been used used to address racial conflict and gang violence in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, restorative justice was used to facilitate national healing in post-apartheid South Africa and post-genocide Rwanda. Restorative justice has also been used here in the U.S., um, particularly to try to curb the school-to-prison pipeline in major cities. Um, the, uh, the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project utilized it to catalyze conversations about healing um, after the Jim Crow era was ended, and restorative justice has been implemented both within juvenile and adult justice systems, leading to options for alternative sentencing, victim offender re reconciliation, and community healing. 
uh, restorative justice has reduced uh, recidivism um, and has increased victim satisfaction rates. 43% uh, of individuals released from prison will return within three years. That's the, that's the standard. But only 10 0.8% of people who participated in a Texas-based restorative justice program uh, were uh, went, ever went back to prison. And only 1.1% of those uh, released returned for any kind of violent offense. Uh, when we look at this, the same kind of success rates were in Indianapolis, where they found that 96% of victims who participated in restorative processes were satisfied compared to just 72% of those who didn't. And so we're not just talking about theoretical things. We're talking about things with empirical evidence to back up the legitimacy and the successfulness of this different type of approach. Um, and when we think about this in regards to a kind of final word for sanctuary, I just want to say the fear can be palpable. Um, and that fear um, can really lead us to cling to strategies that really are not reflective of the heart of God. I mean, I think scripture is very clear for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Um, and when we, when we allow that fear to dictate how we engage uh, civically uh, in regards to how we see and define who our neighbor is, um, in regards to our desire to be in relationship with people who are different than us, who come from different communities than us, uh, different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic backgrounds than us, um, our desire to even live into scripture's call to go and visit the prisoner, when that fear prohibits us from doing that, then we're actually not allowing the fullness of the gospel to form who we are and therefore how we engage in the world. And so I think we have to have spaces and places where we can honestly talk about our fears. Um, because one of the things I always say is you can't crucify something that you can't even name. So when you have these fears that ultimately have to be put to death so that Christ can rise and kind of live in and through you, uh, Sanctuary, I want to profoundly encourage you, create spaces for people to talk about their fears, to name their fears, um, and then to talk about in the midst of those fears, how do we work together in community to find spiritual practices that help us to resist uh, succumbing to those fears? Um, how do we uh, find resources that will meet us where we are and help us move to where God is trying to take us? Um, because fear can cripple your witness and fear really is a tactic of the evil one, which scripture is very clear. Satan's whole job is to kill, steal, and destroy our witness in the world. And when we allow fear to dictate what we do, uh, we allow Satan to subtly do that. Um, uh, lastly, I'll just say, when I was a congregational pastor, one of the things I used to explain all the time is that one of the ch most challenging passages in scripture is that we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. Um, right now, you're living in a city where your sight is telling you that death and destruction wins, um, that they have the last word. Um, but we know that the gospel tells us we already know the ultimate outcome. We already know the death, destructions, the powers and the principalities were all humiliated through the resurrection and that the kingdom has already been inaugurated. It's already unfolding. It's not fully unfolded because we still have tragic realities like George Floyd and we still have civil unrest that's been kind of, you know, rising up in your city and nationwide. Uh, but we are called to be people who live as if the not yet is true in the now. Um, the things that we know ultimately will fully come to be when Jesus returns, we're called to live as if those things are true now. And when we live as though, if those things are true now, we literally partner with Jesus as his hands and feet in the world in uh, reconciling the world to God's self. And I think when we thought about that passage historically, the world, honestly, most people, PE, have thought about broken people like you and me. How do we reconcile broken people to God? But it says the world, which includes our broken systems and structures too, which means that we have to go and contend for 
uh, the flourishing of our communities in new ways, in innovative ways that actually call us out of our comfort zones and, and cause us to fully entrust ourselves to the spirit, which is up to something new. Um, and we have to embrace the new the new wineskins and actually really trust the spirit, knowing that God is with us regardless of where the spirit takes us. And we distinctively bear witness to the gospel because of who and whose we are when we are in those new unfamiliar territories. Yeah. Yeah. So good, man. That's so good. So good. Dominique, I, I want to thank you for, um, for, for making space in your week to be with us for a few moments. And um, thank you for not just being here, but truly ministering to us. Um, you, you cast a wonderful vision of um, this, this alternate reality, this alternative um, life that the gospel calls us towards. And you've also just spoken some, some really relevant um, just encouragements to where we are right now in our city. So thanks for loving on us this way. Thank you for your ministry to our denomination and there in Chicago and everywhere else that you get called to these days. Um, and just know that um, here in Minneapolis, there's a little congregation called Sanctuary uh, <laughs> who, who tries to, to, to read everything you write and that we love you, brother. And, and as soon as we're able to, again, gather in person, know that there's a ticket with your name on it to come and continue to share with us. So. Uh, I, I'm going to ask Pastor Rose if you, you'll pray for us and um, then we'll continue in worship. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pray together. God, what a gift, Lord, that you have given us this morning through the ministry, the genius, the passion of Dominique, Lord. God, we are so grateful um, for the ways that you have um, spoken through him in such clear and particular contextual, seasonal ways, Lord. We are so grateful um, just to be able to receive, Lord. So God, I do pray that we would be able to receive with humble and gracious open hearts this morning, today, um, to hear what he has spoken to us, Lord God. God, we pray for his family. We pray for um, his ministry and life, Lord. We just ask that you would bless him richly, Lord God, um, that this time would not be something that, you know, is um, a hindrance or um, take an energy from him, Lord, but that it would revive him to um, just remind him of the ways that he is blessing our uh, congregation, blessing our denomination, Lord God, and ultimately um, your kingdom as well, Lord. So God, give us the ears to hear, um, posture our hearts and shift our hearts so we might um, fully comprehend and do all that you are calling us to, Lord God. In this series, no doubt you're asking us to shift, to question, to open our uh, minds with uh, just a wondering posture, Lord. So we ask that you would continue to do your good work in us, Lord God. Um, as a church, as a community, Lord, and God, that these words would not um, fall on deaf ears or um, idle hands, Lord, but that you would use them to continue to uh, move our congregation forward in the vision that you have for us, Lord God. So God, thank you for this call that you've, and this challenge that you've given us today. Um, Lord, we ask that we would be able to move forward, um, being reminded of what your alternative is as followers of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. So God, uh, thank you for this opportunity again. Bless Dominique richly, Lord God. And we just ask that you would be with us, continue to be with us as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.